Sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gunblog Variety Cast, episode 15. Back to the Gun Blog Variety Cast, and that was special musical guest Lil Wizard singing "Let It Go" from Disney's Frozen. I'm your host Sean from NC Gun Blog, and with me today is Adam from Guns Cars Tech Blog. How are you doing, Adam? Do you wanna build a snowman? We watch Frozen all the time here. I just, I, as as the parents of of a two year old, we decided it was culturally important for us to watch Frozen. That was a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, <sighs> way it goes. Yeah. So, a uh, uh, little housekeeping. Marco, the guy who writes fantastic Space Kablooey novels, as he puts it. Yes. His last name is Close. Close. Marco Close. Not Marco Clus, but Marco Close, which is kind of funny because if you listen to the audiobook, which I subjected my wife to nine hours and however many minutes of Marco's <laughs> first book, the guy who reads it calls him Marco Clus. Right. Because it looks appara- like. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Apparently, Marco's just decided it's his gnome de plume, his second gnome de plume after <laughs> Major Caudle USMC retired. Yes. So, tactical dog and fitness report. I'm up spending Thanksgiving holiday with my family. I'm happy to tell you this because by the time you hear this podcast, I'll be home. So, yeah. My dog's having a great time up here playing with my parents' dog, Lady. They're romping and playing and having a good time. And last week, 33.2 dog walking miles. Good, good, good. Uh, well, so last week we had a weigh-in with the uh, uh-huh. tactical dog. How's it go? And she's back up to 80 pounds. I have no idea how this happened. So she gained two pounds. So she started off at 82, and then she went down to like 78, and then now she's back up to 80. So uh, she and I both are now walking a lot more. So I am going to try to walk her uh, about two and a half, three miles every morning. We'll see how well that works out for me. You do know that she doesn't have opposable thumbs, so she can't feed herself. Correct. Okay, there you go. We cut her food a lot, and yeah, that's, I don't know how she gained weight. I, mm-hmm. Somebody's giving the dog treats. Somebody. I don't know. My wife goes back to work on Monday, so maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Erin. Erin wants to tell us more about cold weather survival. This week, she's going to tell us about how to survive winter weather if you get caught outside the home. Aaron, last week you told us how to handle really nasty weather if we're caught at home and we lose power and we're stuck there for some length of time. What happens if we're caught away from home? How do we prepare so we can survive that? The pat answer, of course, is never go outside unless you absolutely have to. But, unfortunately, there may be some times when you have to go out. So, if you do have to go out in a mess like this, here's what you do in order to pad your chances for survival. Always, always, always have your get-home bag or car survival kit with you. Now, I understand there may be some people who, because they take mass transit, don't have a car survival kit and can't always carry their get-home bag with them. In that case, I would recommend that when they go into work, they fill up a, like a gym bag and put some things in it like toothbrush, toothpaste, an extra blanket, a change of clothes, fresh socks and underwear are a big deal, maybe some comfort food. And so the idea is that if you're trapped in the office for a day or two, you can make your enforced camping trip a little bit more pleasant. Now, when you leave the house, just treat it like it's an excursion into a hostile environment, because if you get stuck... That's what it's going to become. You could be stuck out there for hours or days. And if you are wearing the wrong clothing, 
or a bad thing happens to you, things can get ugly really quickly. Don't depend on your car to always work. Cold weather is just bad for cars in general, so you are going to need to make sure that everything is working well on it. Get the tires checked. Get the battery checked. Make sure that it is at its best so it can serve you. Don't count on your car's heater to keep you warm, either. People have died when their cars have gotten stuck and the car has run out of fuel and people have succumbed to hypothermia. Or maybe they've spun out on some ice, the car has crashed. Oh, if these people get wet, things can get really bad. So don't assume that just because work and home are a shirt sleeve environment that you can just dash to the car and everything's going to be okay. No, make sure that you always have warm and waterproof boots, a hat and gloves, and a winter coat on you. Speaking of winter coat, let's talk about dressing in layers whenever possible. The three-layer system is what I'm going to talk about. Your inner layer is going to be either wool or synthetics, and that helps keep you warm, but more importantly, it pulls moisture away from you. Cotton is great for the summer, but it's terrible in winter because it absorbs your sweat, it gets soggy, and it sticks it right to you. Wool, even though it can be scratchy, it pulls the moisture away from your body so it can evaporate. It's much better for you. So have that wool or synthetic inner lining. Yeah, I'm a bit of a heretic on this. I know that a lot of people really, really hate wool socks. I love my old army green socks, which turned into old army black socks. I still have some. <gasps> oh, They're my God. Wonderful. And people hate those things. <laughs> They're made of sandpaper. Yes, but they're warm and dry sandpaper. Spoken like a grunt. <laughs> so the middle layer is going to be insulation. It's usually fleece, and the idea is that it traps air in pockets, and your body heat warms that air, and that is what keeps you nice and toasty. Your outer layer is going to be a coat that is primarily waterproof and windproof. I know that some people have winter parkas that are designed to keep them dry and warm, and that's great for convenience, but in a lot of ways that's bad because sweating in cold weather is the worst thing that can happen to you. You sweat, you get wet on the inside, you take some of your clothes off, you can become hypothermic. With those parkas, you end up in a, uh, you know, in a three little bear situation. This one's too hot. And this one's too cold, and you don't have it just right because you only got that one layer. Exactly. So if you have layers, when you start to get hot, you start shedding some so that you can maintain your body temperature, and then as you start to get cold, you can put them back on again. It's a little bit more work, but we are talking about your survival here, so I think that is important. You need to have a way to get in contact with the rest of the world, whether it's just to tell your family that, hey... I'm stuck here, but I'm okay. Or if you are stuck on the freeway and you need to call the police to come rescue you. So always have a cell phone with you. Always have a means of charging your phone, whether it be a USB charger, and there are going to be recommendations in the show notes, or you can do what one of my co-bloggers does. He carries a physical battery for his phone. And when it gets down, he can just pull the battery out, put the fresh one in. You've got to be able to use the phone before it'll be of use to you. Finally, if you're trying to get in touch with people and the lines are down, either because it's an emergency and everyone's trying to call home, or there's a power loss and not all of the cell towers are functioning, do not call people, text them. Texting is far more efficient. You only need just the barest minimum of a bar to get through, and the time to send a text is, what, only a few seconds compared to the 30 seconds to a minute of talking to people and letting them know that you're all right. Now, sadly, we can't yet text 911 to help us, but what you can do in an emergency is text a family member and tell them where you are and have them call 911 to come get you. All right, Aaron. You've always got a good post for us. Where can we find more information on cold weather survival? There are two blog posts that I'm going to recommend. One of them is from my co-blogger, Loki Dude, and it's titled Cold Weather Considerations. He lives in Utah, 
where there's a lot of snow. And the other is from my dear friend Bridget, and she's got a post on winter survival on her blog. And I encourage listeners to check out both of them. Excellent. All right, Aaron, it was good to talk to you. See you again next week. See you next week, Sean. If you'd like to read more from Erin, check out her blog, lurkingrhythmically.blogspot.com. Felons behaving badly. Duplin County deputies arrest suspect in execution-style murder. Deputies have arrested a Duplin County man accused of shooting and killing a witness in the suspect's upcoming murder trial. All right, so this guy's already up for murder. Right. And he kills a witness, is what they're saying. Yeah. Suspect of Wallace is accused of shooting and killing 27-year-old victim of Wilmington on November 12th. It was an execution-style murder, Sheriff Wallace said. Victim was scheduled to testify in suspect's upcoming trial for another murder, court documents show. Victim was a father with a 5-month-old and a 2-year-old and a 9-year-old, according to his family. According to Sheriff Wallace, suspect asked victim to come by suspect's house after work. Suspect then allegedly shot and killed victim execution-style in an abandoned mobile home on Ward's Road between Wallace and Harrell's, Sheriff Wallace explained. Just so I'm clear... You're testifying against a guy, and he invites you over, and you say, sure, no problem. Maybe they were good friends. Sure. All right. Suspect's trial for the Wilmington murder was scheduled to begin on January 30th, 2015, the district attorney said. In February 2014, a judge agreed to a pretrial release for suspect, which included a $10,000 unsecured bond, electronic monitoring, and house arrest court documents show. Suspect was ordered to avoid contact with any witnesses, including the victim, who was named as a key witness in Suspect's murder trial, the court documents say. He's in real trouble now. He violated yeah. that judge's order not to talk to that witness. Yeah, but about 8.56 p.m. on November 12th, Suspect electronic monitoring device was cut off, warrants say. The location where law enforcement found the device was about nine miles from where the victim was murdered, said investigators. Now, I want to point out here, unsecured bond. You know what that means? That means he just promised to pay and didn't actually have to put anything up? He did not actually pay anything on this bond. It was, hey, um, yeah, I'll pay $10,000 if I don't show up. Yeah. The guy was up on murder charges and got bond of $10,000 but didn't have to pay any of it. Not even the 5 or 10%. That's awesome. Let's find out who these wonderful people are. We already know that he's up on murder charges, the suspect is, and we also already know that the victim was a father with a nine-year-old, a two-year-old, and a five-month-old, so a great family man, right? Sure. So the suspect, burglary second degree, felon class G, unauthorized use of a motor conveyance, misdemeanor class 1, uh, assault on a policeman, misdemeanor class A1, possessed oh. schedule 2, felon class I, assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury. There you go. Felon, class H. And this is just what he was convicted of. This has nothing to do with any, pre- any you know, upcoming trials. That's just what he was convicted of. And the victim, in addition to being a family man, receiving, possessing firearm, felon, class G. I assume that must mean he was a felon in possession because previous to that, he was convicted of possession with intent to sell, schedule 2, felon, class H. And possess, schedule 2, felon, class I. Possessed with intent to sell Schedule 1, Felon, Class H. Uh, Again, operate motor vehicle without a license, Class 2 misdemeanor. So what do we see here? A pattern. A pattern. (laughs) What we see now is a pattern, once again, of criminals killing criminals. What we don't see is a concealed handgun permit holder or just any random citizen involved in this. We have a criminal killing another criminal. It just happened that one of those criminals was going to testify against the other, and the other one didn't appreciate that and killed him for it. Or at least is alleged to have. Yeah. Well, let's talk with Nikki Canyon about foreign policy for grown-ups. Nikki has some thoughts on terrorism. Well, hey, Nikki. How are you doing today? I am absolutely fabulous because I am on vacation. Wonderful. Well, let's drag you back to some of the negative parts of life. I wanted to talk to you today about terrorism. What is terrorism? What is it? Well... That's kind of a tough question. In order to answer it, we really need to look at its nature more than its definition. First of all, 9-11 did not start terrorism. Terrorism has been around for much longer than that. Its subject and its definition only started getting massive attention after the 9-11 attacks. 
So I studied the issue a bit when I did my master's in national security studies. The way I define terrorism, and my professor kind of agreed with me, it's the deliberate targeting of civilian populations in order to cause terror. And ultimately the goal is to undermine the population's faith in its leadership and its government to undermine its confidence in the very fundamental basis of what the country is. It is violence for political means. Now, we all heard the, uh, von Clausewitz's wars politics by other means. Terrorism is not formal politics or formal military. It is not a state actor doing these acts. It is extension of war by other means. And it's certainly not limited to Islamic terrorism, but since Islamic terrorism is kind of what the world focuses on right now, so let's discuss that. One of the things I keep hearing is, is that terrorism is all the fault of U.S. foreign policy. Is terrorism our fault? Did we cause this? Well, I, I recently read a blog on the Washington Post that claims, yes, there is some kind of correlation between our actions overseas and terrorist acts. On one hand, our foreign policy does create power vacuums. We remove leaders and we create this opening. As we know, nature abhors a vacuum. So rivaling violent factions tend to fill that hole, and they battle each other for power. Their violence demands more violence, it demands growth, it demands more authority, and it allows the populace they themselves oppress to actually blame the foreign power for creating the vacuum in the first place. But on the other hand, we also have people who obviously do not respect natural rights, who want to expand their own power and influence at the expense of others, and they have their own twisted version, in this case, of their religion. And we all understand that certain tenets of Islam do support the extremists' claim that they have the right to infringe on the rights of others, but ultimately what happens is they really haven't come out into the 21st century. What causes people to become terrorists in the first place? I mean, how do you end up joining a group like this and, and why would you stay? This is something that academics have studied for quite a while. Uh, I've done a bit of reading on this. Um, there's certainly traits that Islamic terrorists share. Um, the one thing they're not is overall mentally ill. They're not impoverished or oppressed. They have other options. There's a guy named Lawrence Wright who describes what he calls displacement in his book, uh, The Looming Tower. And what he said, and I quote, what the recruits tended to have in common, besides their urbanity, their cosmopolitan backgrounds, their education, their facility with languages, and their computer skills, was displacement. And what he means is that those who joined the Islamic Jihad did so in a country other than the one in which they were reared. In other words, if they were born in Algeria, they went to France to cause terrorist acts. Uh, Moroccans in Spain, uh, Yemenis in Saudi Arabia. We've seen fighters recruited from Libya to go in through Syria, receive training, and then fight in Iraq. So despite their accomplishments, they had little standings in the host societies where they lived. So they went and they fought elsewhere. But these are individuals, so it's tough to actually look at separate individuals. There are other factors around them that had to have caused this. For example, economic factors. Believe it or not, the Muslim world, which used to be kind of ahead of its time, is now largely backward economically. They export a lot of oil, but that profit doesn't wind up in you know, benefiting the small guy. It winds up in the hands of a few. It doesn't positively impact society. They also have educational issues. So there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, and they have produced very few Nobel recipients. Of course, they'll blame Islamophobia and racism of the West for that sad fact, but fact is a lot of them are extremely backward. A lot of them are illiterate. They don't even know what the Quran says other than what their extremist imams tell them. And then we come to this blame factor. It, extremist Islamic leaders claim the West is actively pursuing war with them. They're actively and inherently anti-Islamic. It's like they're stuck in the 
era of crusades. They justify their philosophy that the West and Islam are at, are at perpetual war by pointing to the crusades. To them, the crusades were two weeks ago. In simple terms, this ideology prompts them to wage war against the West, regardless of what the West does or does not do. So the bottom line is, of course, foreign policy does have consequences. But to claim that we somehow have created terrorist movements or somehow gave them rise or somehow made them do what they do is to ignore the fact that these people do not respect human rights, want their twisted version of their religious tenets to be spread all over the world, and they are waging a war that was over a very long time ago. All right, Nikki, it was good to talk to you. See you again next week. You bet. Take care. Well, Nikki blogs at thelibertyzone.com. Strange laws. So as I said, I'm up at my folks' house for, uh, for Thanksgiving, and... Uh, my father has about, oh, I guess it's like 18 acres, and he has a woodchuck problem. The problem mm. being there are woodchucks. Not the beer or the cider. No, not the cider. No, no. <laughs> actual woodchucks, uh, sometimes referred to as groundhogs or um, uh, they might be some other thing we call them. Rodents. I think they call them, yeah, giant rats is what they yeah. are. My dad has to shoot them either with a bolt action rifle or with my mom's lever action youth model henry 22 <laughs> now now that seems a little hmm that seems a little strange why doesn't he use something i don't know handier than that yeah well in pennsylvania it's illegal to use a semi-automatic firearm to hunt unless it's a shotgun in certain circumstances and limited to three rounds and two in the chamber or two one in the chamber two in the in the reload tube or whatever the heck it is like waterfowl only or something like that that what (laughs) yeah seriously this is a pennsylvania law it's like chapter 34 or something like that the 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 paragraph is 2308 unlawful devices and methods this is hunting game general rule except as otherwise provided in this title it is unlawful for any person to hunt or aid abet assist or conspire to hunt any game or wildlife through the use of number one an automatic firearm or similar device so yes you cannot whip out your M60 machine gun and start gunning down deer. Well, that is kind of understandable. You know, it ruins the meat. A semi-automatic rifle or pistol. Okay. Or, number four, was there's three is reserved. I don't know why three is reserved. So one, two, and four. <laughs> Got me. A semi-automatic shotgun or magazine shotgun for hunting or taking small game, fur bearers, turkey, or unprotected birds, unless the shotgun is plugged to a two-shell capacity in the magazine. So, two plus one. Okay. Now, fur bearers. Fur bearers, yeah. Um, is that is this that's a groundhog? That's what they call furry animals. No, groundhog's a varmint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they actually treat it separately in the law. Oh, well, uh, all right. Because they're, it, I mean, same way that they treat feral pigs oh, differently okay. in the law in North Carolina. Because they're, they're vermin They're special. Animal. Yeah. Because you know what? Effectively, you can't kill them all, so nobody cares. <laughs> well, the, the big problem with this is, is that my father has to use this Henry 22 rifle lever action. I guess there is a good thing to it. He's not going to steal my really nice 1022. Yeah. But uh, I guarantee you, if my father could have a 1022 to shoot woodchucks, he would totally have one. So, Ruger... Get in on with this, uh, this Pennsylvania Game Commission and put, your, you know, put the screws to them because you're not selling a 1022 to my dad until this happens. And uh, I know from Oddball, the guy who blogs with me, it's mm-hmm. very, very hard to find a non-youth 22 caliber rifle that's bolt action. It is a little bit difficult. There's two states in the entire country that will not permit you to use a semi-auto rifle for hunting. One of them is Delaware and one of them is Pennsylvania. That's so weird. I, you know, things like this... It kind of makes you wonder, you know, where did this come from? And, you know, that that whole thing about number three being reserved, that's probably there was probably something else there. And and that somebody said, well, that's kind of dumb. Let's let's take that out. And instead of having to rewrite other statutes, they just removed it and put reserve there. Yeah, probably something along those lines. But the whole thing's kind of silly. Uh, you read some of the stories. It's, oh, my goodness. They, they're going to just go out there and start bang, 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 bang at the deer like. Do they do that in any other state? Well, then shut up. Well, you can't, 
you know, point to other states and say, oh, hey, man. look, 90% of the rest of the population doesn't have this problem. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Our hunters are morons. Yeah, I, really, that's what it sounds like they're trying to say. Yeah. Well, Miguel wants to talk with us about Joyce Foundation-funded Entertainment Industry Council's Anti-Gun Depiction Suggestions book. Today is Chapter 5, Guns for Protection, Empowering or Imperiling? Miguel, you found another chapter of the Entertainment Industries Council's Firearm Depiction Suggestions. Well, it really looks like what they're trying to do is tell the media, hey, you need to depict guns like this so we can scare everybody. You're right on that spot. You know, they, they, this is supposed to be a guideline on how to treat uh, guns in, in movies and TV shows. But all the suggestions that ma they make are always in the negative. You know, you never see them portraying something good happening out of having guns. Maybe, perhaps, a cop. And that's very unusual. In their chapter 5, they go for guns for protection, empowering or imperiling. Wow, man, basically, you're, we are stupid. Yeah, I'm reading some of these things, and boy, it's every anti-gun trope you ever see on TV. It's almost as if the people who are writing TV and movies, they're reading this, and they're just doing this in their shows. Let's go over them, and you'll see that this, that that's the way they're portrayed every time we see something on TV or in the movies. Right. Consider the reality that in self-defense, homeowners often freeze up or tremble when trying to deploy a gun, rendering them unable to deploy it, or show them as being too paralyzed by fear even to reach for the gun. If you have studied something about the guns for use in self-defense and whatnot, or self-defense in general, we've gone through the flight, fight, or freeze def uh, effect. But according to them, if you're attacked and you have a gun for some reason, the gun will paralyze you. Something so simple to use as a gun which is, you know, extension of an arm, make a grip, which is also a natural movement, you know, pull a trigger, which is another natural movement. It is something that you will freeze. You're too stupid. Now, we see every day that people, you know, bad guys break into people's homes and they get shot. So, obviously, that is not reality. But they, these people are not involved in reality. What they want, you know, is embed the idea that your response, if somebody breaks into your house and you have a gun, is to freeze, to be killed. It's like they're trying to teach us, oh, you know, you're just a victim. All you're going to be is a victim. So why do you even try to avoid being a victim? Exactly. Either, you know, don't have a gun, okay? Or if you have a gun, your, your response is going to be freeze. You're not going to defend yourself. Speaking of not having a gun, consider having characters successfully use alternatives to guns for self-defense, such as pepper spray or mace. Or the infamous uh, wasp spray. Oh, geez, yeah, that. There's a contradiction here. If you, somebody breaks into your house and you have a gun, you're supposed to be paralyzed. But if you have something else, then you become Superman. If I'm too scared to use a gun, how am I supposed to think, oh, let me climb underneath the counter and get the wasp spray out? Come on now. Yeah, you get the seven iron or the baseball bat or, or, or you know, some stupid stuff like that. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the thing. They never make any sense on what they deploy. They are, you know, completely off the, off the reservation uh, in this kind of stuff. Right. You covered this before. You said, why is it that I'm supposed to use a lesser means of defending myself when I can use the greater? The standard, the legal standard is if we're confronted by deadly force, our response should be deadly force. We are legally uh, allowed to do so. Why am I, do I have to go, you know, playing patty cakes with, with somebody who wants me armed? Exactly. Consider emphasizing that what the shooter thinks is self-defense may simply be an escalating confrontation between two people that led to a shooting. Both sides may claim self-defense, and neither side may be right. That's one more, again, you know, you're too stupid to understand the complexities of the legal ramifications of a self-defense. Yeah, seriously, that's all that is. You're just too stupid. So therefore, it's better for you to be a victim so we can have a very well-defined case. This is the guy, he pulled the trigger or, or used the knife, and this is the guy who ended up bleeding. This is victim, and this is the guy, we have no problems. Hey, guess what? I am not here to make your life easier, okay? I'm here to survive. Exactly. This goes right along with the next one. Consider having a character use a gun in what he or she believes is self-defense, only to be charged with murder or manslaughter, because it's determined that excessive or unjustified lethal force was deployed. How have we seen a case like that just recently? 
Yes, we have. We've seen several cases just like that recently. And they hate it because we have managed to, you know, to pass more legislation telling, you know, this is a good guy. He was minding his own business. He was innocent. Somebody came along attacking him. He was the proper amount of, of uh, a gun and stopped the guy. He shouldn't be punished. But no. Remember, it's also a sense of, of full morality these people have. If you use lethal force for self-defense, it's equally as bad if, if you were shooting uh, a bus full of, of uh, orphans and raping the nuns. That really goes along with the next one here. If a character is offered a gun for self-protection or retaliation, consider having him or her refuse it as a bad idea that could just worsen the situation. You can pretty much eliminate the, the or in self-protection or, or, or uh, retaliation. Because for them, it's the same thing. Okay? It, it's simply, you know, if you use a gun, you've been warned you're going to be attacked, and you arm yourself, you're retaliating. Once again, the false morality that being a victim is supposed to be superior. Bull! They're coming after me. I got a warning. If I, there's nothing else I can do, and I can grab my weapon and you know and defend myself, I will do it. I'm not gonna wait for the cops to show up because they may never show up. Yeah, you're right. They seem to think that self-protection and retaliation are the same thing. It's like they believe, oh, you should just die. So it's better for the world if you just let yourself get killed. I I don't understand that. D that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense, okay? Because if it makes sense, they, they, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't be having this discussion. But remember, these are the, the people that are smart. These are the people that want to direct and dictate your life. That means you, by default, they consider you stupid. So they got to tell you how to do and how you're supposed to behave. It won't apply to them, only to us, the little people. So it, it's that. It's like no matter what you do, you're too stupid. You are should be allowed to defend yourself. Die! It's, it's better. It makes th things simple for, uh, th much simple for us. All right, Miguel. It's good to talk to you. See you again next week. See you next week. Get more Miguel Gonzalez daily at gunfreezone.net. Fun with headlines. Okay, so the last couple of weeks we did stuff that was a little bit, you know, kind of fun and crazy. You know, some zombies here, some really crazy... Liberal stuff over here. Well, now we're going to get back to a headline that says one thing and the story says something mostly different. So, headline. Man arrested for shooting two dogs, killing one in North Nashville. A man was arrested early Sunday morning after reportedly shooting and killing a dog in North Nash Nashville and injuring another. So far, so good. Okay. According to an affidavit, suspect and a second man started shooting at a home in the 1600 block of 22nd Avenue North. The victim told police he had been dropped off at home when a vehicle pulled up in front of his house. A person inside asked, what you got for me? The victim ignored the individual and proceeded to walk into the home. He told police he noticed the vehicle pull into the church parking lot next to his home, and a few moments later, he heard gunshots. So, where's the dogs? Where's, where's the dogs? The man and woman inside the home were forced to dive to the floor to avoid being hit. According to the affidavit, they were able to call police for help and when officers arrived on the scene, they reportedly saw two people running from the area. Now, remember, these guys were in a car, and then now they're running from the area. Officers were able to apprehend one suspect in the 2200 block of Osage Street. Two firearms were reportedly found on the ground along the path suspect ran from police, a 38 revolver and a 40 caliber Glock pistol. A check for the serial numbers showed the Glock pistol was stolen. This is my shocked face. Suspect does not have a valid handgun carry permit, according to an affidavit. That's <laughs> well, that's helpful to know. <laughs> that is helpful to know. During the investigation, police discovered that the suspects had also fired shots at the back of the home where two dogs were. One was killed and another was injured. Officers found bullet casings in the church parking lot and around the home that matched the two weapons. I, well, doubt, I doubt it matched I doubt they found weapons. the revolver. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. maybe he reloaded. Maybe he like dumped, you know, did a did a full Mas Ayub stress fire reload, that, but I doubt it. That's possible. Uh, bullet holes were found in the home, which caused more than one thousand dollars worth of damage. Suspect twenty four faces multiple charges, including three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill, killing an animal, and attempting to kill an animal. This dude was not arrested for shooting and killing two dogs. <laughs> shooting no. and killing two dogs happened in the middle of the yes. crap that he did to get arrested. Yes, yes. Uh, the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill. is That's kind of really what he got arrested for. Yeah. 
Now, of course, if we say he's arrested for killing a dog, you know, he shot into somebody's house. Wow, that's really bad. But he killed a dog. People are going to put him under the jail for that. Yes, yes. I will tell you that uh, after, you know, reading this story, it does sound like he's the guy. But so if the DA went to, to trial with this amount of information, there was a guy running away from a house that had just been shot at. And we found a gun on, on the path that he took. I could not convict that guy. That's true. If if it was me and I'm walking down the street, minding my own business, you know, because that's what you do when you get shot in this world. I'm minding my own business on the street <laughs> and gunfire rings out. What's what is the thing that I'm going to do? Run away. Exactly. So he was acting in this case exactly as one would expect a person who is innocent to act. Run away from the gunfire. Right, right. And so, you know, what happened to the two guys in the car? That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know, too. So man arrested for shooting two dogs, killing one in North Nashville. No, he was arrested for shooting at a a bunch of people in a house. Yeah. (laughs) But still, put him under the jail. If, right. he, if he did it, put him under yeah. the jail. Varon wants to talk about how a Tennessee Sheriff's Department found out the importance of offline backups in Tech Tips with the Baron. So, Baron, I saw this really interesting story where a sheriff's office in Tennessee managed to get their entire set of case files, their electronic case files, hijacked by some sort of malware that uh, encrypted all of it. Nobody could get into their files until they paid $500. So uh, as a computer person, as a computer person who does with, uh, deals with a lot of security issues, how does something like this happen? So first question is, who lost their job over this? Because somebody should have. Probably true. First and foremost, though, is let's discuss a common mistake that many people make, and that is they use the cloud as their backup. The thing is, is the cloud isn't a backup. Backups are traditionally offline and preferably off-site. The cloud is a convenience tool. It allows us to easily synchronize files between multiple computers, our phones, and other devices so that we can easily access the same file from multiple places and they're synchronized. At the same time, this means that there's API hooks so that if you, say, had malware installed on a computer, it could actually go access those files. And in this case, the virus or malware came in via probably some web ad or something else. Someone clicked. It was allowed to execute because the second you click, you're telling the computer to do something. And so it goes and does its thing. And the end result was it went and found files and started encrypting them. So first and foremost, don't click on things that you shouldn't be clicking on. Uh, be very, very wary when you have pop-up ads. Yeah, there's a little click, you know, click X to close the box. Sometimes X to close the box doesn't really close the box. It causes the other things to run. I usually just kill the browser window at that point. But back to the backups, use DVDs, for example. You know, DVD reader, USB thumb drive. Uh, the benefit of DVDs, they're read-only. Once you write them, they're not going to get written over again. They do deteriorate over time. USB thumb drives, you can plug them in, back up your files, and then unplug it. Once you've unplugged it, nothing can go access those files anymore. So if at some later future point, you have malware that comes along, trashes your computer, well, you still have the backup. So you can reformat, reinstall your computer, and, oh, look, I still have my important critical files. You could also use an external hard drive, for example. The key is, is removing it so that it is inaccessible. That's the key. It needs to be inaccessible from the rest of the web. How about antivirus software or anti-malware software? Is that stuff valuable? Would that prevent this from happening? It should definitely help. The problem is, is it's no guarantee because malware is designed specifically to try and avoid detection. And so you really have an arms race between the people writing the detection software and the people who are writing the malware. While it certainly helps, and if there's something that's common out there in the field and they found it, they can deal with that. But if they've never seen it before, you're completely and utterly hosed. And even then, there will be some pieces of malware that are picked up by some antivirus, anti-malware packages such as McAfee. And then there's Norton, which will then go and pick up some others. The problem is, is you can't actually run two of these things next to each other because they each point at the other one and say, hey, you're malware. Yes. (laughs) If you install two of these packages on the computer next to each other, they will point at the other one and say that it's an evil piece of software. 
I do remember hearing from time to time that there is constant suspicion whether or not the anti-malware companies themselves produce malware in the name of selling more product. So I'm not going to tell you not to run one. I highly recommend that people run it. It doesn't need to be go and be something over the top, royally expensive. Just something to at least provide you a base level of protection. And most importantly, depending on the type being used, for example, AVG for a while would hook into your web browser and would inform you if you're going into a website that is known to serve up malware. And Chrome, for the most part, has actually been picking that up. Google has its own indexing service to determine whether or not, as they go through and scan websites for their search engine, they also check for malware. And if they see malware in the website, they actually index it as such. And so now when you're surfing around in Chrome and you end up at some website, it'll pop up bright red and say, this website's known to serve malware. Do you really want to go here? If that pops up, hit the back button immediately. Don't just skip on through because usually bad things are about to happen. Yeah. You know, if uh, ladies came with a little sign that says, I'm going to give you a virus, you would not be involved with them. I figured computers are probably the same. If some computer goes to the trouble of telling me, hey, don't go to this site, I'm not going to that site. That's very, very wise. If you're getting a warning, it means that something has gone horribly, horribly wrong, and you should probably listen to it. All right. Now, these were police files. If police officers get a hold of evidence, like physical evidence from a scene, and then they lose control of it, they don't know where it is for a period of time, then that evidence falls outside of what's called chain of custody. It is now not evidence anymore. It's random trash. What's the likelihood some of this stuff will mess up future cases because they can't prove that something hasn't been altered? That's a very valid question. And they may actually end up having to throw out a bunch of cases. It depends entirely what the files were. If the files were just generic case files that describe, you know, here's what happened, you know, here's the case number and so on and so forth, but it's not the actual evidence that's going to be submitted, they'll probably be okay. But if contained within that case file was, say, the blood test results for somebody's DUI, yeah, a lawyer's going to have a fun time because now you have to prove that that blood test result was completely unaltered, you know, beginning to end. Yes, it may be decrypted, but they may have botched the decryption and screwed up some bytes in there. They have to prove that the file is the exact same thing it was now as it was then. Mm, And that could be pretty rough. Unless they took the time and effort on the front end, there's no way they can do it. Mm. All right, Baron. It was good to talk to you. See you again next week. See you next week, Sean. Baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org. So one thing that Baron kind of touched on, uh, it's very important, is the 3 two, one backup strategy that everybody should implement. You want three copies of your data on at least two different forms of media and at least one offsite location. Okay, sounds good. I'll make sure to back up all my data and put it in my car on a chip or something. There you go. And of course, nobody does that. Nobody ever, no. Well, the quest for Sharpshooter continues. Oh, yes. How's that going? Uh, not as well as I had hoped, but it's still going. I shot the Shoot to Live Low Light No Light match on Saturday the 22nd of November, and it was pretty cool because my brother was in town, so Brian and I went and shot this match. Had a great time. My brother, of course, much better shooter than me. He outshot me. I came in 35th out of 39. Oh, well, you know. I wasn't so the last. <laughs> right. But it was, wow. Have you ever shot in the dark? I have not, and I really want to be oh, able to do that one day. Oh, my. Yeah, so we should set something like that up. You and I should totally take one of them surefire night shoot courses. After I've actually learned to shoot, maybe like do the advanced stuff like shoot at night. But it was it was very different. Now a lot of the no light, no the the low light and no light, they were like, you can't use a flashlight in this segment. And there were some stuff that a lot of the shooters were like, there's no way I'd take that shot. I mean, <laughs> no way. Uh, uh, you know, you can't identify your target. Yeah, I'm not a cop. I well, have liability attached to that. Yeah, true. Uh, my view is, is if they're shooting at me, I'm going to shoot back at them. Um, that's just, you know, too bad. Unless I have a place of cover. Like if I'm inside a house and they're shooting at me and I'm not really able to identify them, yeah, I'm going to retreat to the center part of the house and stay low. And, you know, if they come in the door, I'll be able to see them then. But right. uh, 
you know, I'm not just going to hose down the street, but if I'm in the street and they're shooting at me, I'm going to take some shots back. But it was, it was a little bit difficult. Now, some of it was hard in that, you know, you had to figure out how to manipulate a gun and you had to manipulate a flashlight and still hit a target. So I had to shoot one handed, which, um, I have enough trouble shooting two handed. Shooting one hand is a little, a little more difficult than that. So I did the whole neck index thing where you hold the flashlight against your neck so that you know where it is, and then you just sort of aim your body. Oh, okay. I shot very slowly, but I hit my targets. I actually had pretty good, uh, pretty good accuracy. Good, good, uh, good. Now, my brother, on the other hand, he came in 27 out of 39, so he did significantly better than I did. And you know how it is when you see these, you know, you see the scores, there's like low, 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 and towards the end it sort of like ramps up pretty severely yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brian was much further down on that score, <laughs> but there was some actual really good shooters there, obviously, because it is a competition. And that was his first IDPA shoot, so I was really proud. Well, congratulations to him. Yeah, so I need to practice, but how do you practice? How do you practice shooting? You go to the range and just blow off a bunch of rounds and make noise? Actually, you can't. You know, that's not practice. That's proving that your practice works. So right. I, I was listening to Triangle Tactical Podcast episode number 107, and they had USPSA Grandmaster Steve Anderson who's in addition to being a USPSA grandmaster also does that shooting show podcast. I'm going to listen to that too. He's pretty well renowned as the mental game guy and the dry fire guy. So okay. uh, Ben from triangle tactical is all about the dry fire. So he's going to, I know I've said this before, but next week I'm going to go over to his house and he's going to teach me one, two, three drills. I don't know how many, and I'm going to practice those drills for a month and then go to the next shoot. And I think what I'll, what I'll try to do is each month when I go to the shoot to live, I'll have, done some drills and then I'll get some new drills or the next month and work on them and then just continue to improve that way. As, as Steve Anderson said, NBA players don't just show up at the game and play the game and say, hey, you know, I can practice in the game. No, they, they practice beforehand. They practice right. their layups. They play up, practice a little dribbling, practice their jump shots. Well, you know, maybe I should practice some of that stuff before I show up at the match and try to shoot the, shoot the match. My personal arms dealer, Reese, at the gun crew, stop by and say hi. He says that IDPA stands for I don't practice anymore. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And that's kind of true. So I don't need to practice because I'm shooting competitions. Right. No, no, no. And I really (laughs) think that this IDPA thing is is identifying my problems. One, don't shoot accurately enough. Two, don't shoot fast enough. There's my problems right there. Yeah. And it'll give me some incentive to practice properly so that I'll be better at it. And that's really all I need is here's, here's, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's how to improve that. And I will continue right now. It's very simple what I'm doing wrong, but as I get better at the basics Mm -hmm. and I try to apply those basics faster and faster, I'll identify new problems and then I'll figure out how to attack them and just be a better shooter. So I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I have been the fastest guy in the slow group at my local club matches for a while. And uh, the guy said, Oh, well just, you know, go and practice doubles because your, your split times are, are too high. So I went and did that this week, and uh, there was a market improvement from the beginning of the, the session to the end of the session. So hopefully that'll help me out if I ever get to go to competition again. Well, you had the baby. Newborn. Yeah. Well, yeah. your wife did. You, you helped, though. I, I was there. Well, today Weird starts a series on that false anti-gun metric, the gun death. He tells us how the use of this false statistic tells us some really ugly things about the gun grabbers in This, this week, week in Anti-Gun, anti-gun nuttery. nuttery. Weird, you do a series on your blog called The Gun Death Files. What's that all about? There's a bunch of bloggers that do different aggregate series about, you know, with taking stories from one particular topic and doing it, you know, much like your felons behaving badly. And so I sat down and said, you know what, I want to do this too. And I started thinking, what do I want to tackle? And one thing that always popped into my head was when you read any sort of anti-gun publication, propaganda, whatnot, they always use this weird metric called gun death. And that really bothered me. What is a gun death? How do they define gun death? Well, a gun death and or a gun crime is a crime or death that is uses a gun. Like accidents, suicides, homicides. It doesn't matter. They lump it all into one category. It does not matter. It's all just so long as a gun was involved, that's all they care. Why do you use gun deaths with the quotes? 
Well, the trick to it is, it seems to be, is that they're doing it to essentially inflate their numbers. They're, uh, they're using it to, you know, include suicides. They're using it to, uh, to make us look worse than other countries. So if you've got another country where guns are essentially impossible to acquire, you don't really have a whole lot of gun use by either the, the citizens or their criminal element. All right. Well, I know you wanted to start with violent crime. What's the problem with focusing simply on gun deaths when you're dealing with violent crime? Well, that's what I deal with in my blog series. I call it the gun death files, but it is, it's never involving gun deaths. It's involving people, you know, ending their lives or being killed some other way. And the reason behind that is, and from the uh, FBI crime statistics for 2013, I quote, firearms were used in 69% of the nation's murders, 40% of robberies, 21.6% of aggravated assaults. Uh, Weapons data is not collected for rape incidents. And so this means that 31% of murders, 60% of robberies, and 78.4% of aggravated assaults were completely ignored by using the gun death metric. That's as if they don't really care if you got murdered with a knife or somebody just beat you to death. It's like, well, you don't count. Yeah, and it it just creates some really, really weird scenarios. And so I've got here in the show notes a a story that was uh, in the New York Times where they were super duper duper happy about uh, in the year 2008 that uh, gun deaths were down in New York City. The only problem was that uh, they were down just a a few percentage points and stabbings were up 50%. And so therefore, more people were dying, just less people dying by means of a gun. And that's a success? Doesn't sound very successful to me. Exactly. Now, of course, also, the, uh, it later came out that the, uh, the numbers that the NYPD were using for that were, uh, were manufactured and they, weren't actually, they were artificially low. It creates a, a, you know, a, a false sense of insecurity, I guess you could say, uh, for it. Is it, you know, it, gives the, it gives the impression that things are, are worse than they are and that somehow gun laws would be far more effective than they actually were. Typically, when you see them do gun deaths, when they start complaining about how many people die due to firearms in the United States, they're trying to compare it to other countries. Is that a valid way to discuss differences between countries? No, not at all. I mean, first up, you've got the simple statement of if it is nearly impossible to acquire a gun in that country, there's not that many guns in circulation, there is going to be less gun death in that country. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's safer. It's just going to mean that the criminal element might use something different. I mean, the Dark Ages, there were no guns at all, but there was a whole lot of violence going on there. Yeah. Uh, another issue is what, what was referred to, uh, I didn't look up the, blog, the blogger's name who came up with this, but uh, apples to meatloaf comparisons for the definition of crime. So, like, the best example is the uh, UK versus the United States. You know, the UK has considerably less gun death than, uh, than the United States. Well, except when they're using things like murders, things like that, they don't consider something a murder until someone's convicted of the murder. And, uh, and then otherwise it's just a homicide of interest. In the United States, we call it our murder rate, but it isn't our murder rate. It's our murder and non-negligent homicide rate. So we include every case where somebody ends up dead by intentional act of another person, whether that turns out to be conviction for murder or just voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, right now in Ferguson, Missouri, if someone is found dead on the sidewalk somewhere and they were had their head kicked in or they've got bullets in them, that's going to be cons- that's going to be counted as a murder, even though we haven't figured out who did it or we may never figure out who did it. In the case of gang killings, large portions of the uh, of the murders, just because of the whole snitches get stitches thing, never get solved. And if we were the UK, that would mean those murders never happened. At least statistically, yes, that's true. And another big thing to look at here is that gun ownership is up. I think we've all been to, been, been to, a, to a gun store or a gun show and seen the amount of interest in firearms. And, you know, the waiting periods for concealed carry permits has gone way up and all that. That's because more people are owning guns. And yet our violent crime is way down. It's down to like 1960s level. And, uh, and that's exactly the opposite of what these people are trying to say with, uh, with uh, more guns equal more crime. So really what I'm trying to say is gun death is not a metric for public safety. That's true. What we really need to care about is total number of people victimized by crime. 
I don't personally care if somebody's stabbed to death, shot to death, or dropped off a building to death. They're dead, that's murder, that's wrong. And if we focus on the tool and we don't focus on the crime, then we're really not making the world a better place. All right, Weird, it was good to talk to you. See you again next week. Awesome, Sean. Talk to you later. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host at The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Stuff that grinds my gears. You've got one today that, that bothers me too. Tell me what you got. I really dislike websites that are trying to game advertising systems from 10 years ago. And by that, I mean what's called CPM, uh, which is cost per thousand views. Two websites that you guys probably read that are pretty uh, bad about this are Drudge with his 30 or 45 second automatic refresh and PJ Media, who likes to put the first 400 words of an article on one page and then the next 400 words of an article on, on the next page to generate page views, which is no longer a, a metric that anyone uses. So what happens with Drudge is I'll be looking at it on my phone and I'm, I'm scrolling. That's another thing, Drudge. Get a freaking mobile site. So I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And I get about three quarters of the way through reading all the headlines. And then the page refreshes. And I have to like go back and find where I was when the page refreshed. PJ Media, my favorite thing is when they have like a 405 word article. And the first 400 words are on one page. And you click next and it's like five words on the last page. But come on, guys. Yeah, one click, one page to read, and I'm done. This clicking through things pisses me off. Yeah, stop it. Yeah, definitely stop that. So uh, let's get on the phone with, uh, with Glenn Reynolds and say, hey, look, knock that crap off. <laughs> Drudge might be a little harder, but maybe we can get Glenn to talk to him. Yeah. Now this week, what really is pissing me off is collective punishment. I hated the idea of collective punishment when I was in school. If I haven't done anything wrong, then I don't want to get in trouble for something that somebody else did. And we have a shining example of collective punishment in UVA coming up right now. UVA bans fraternities until January in wake of campus rape article. Right. Citing great sorrow, great rage, and great determination. University of Virginia President Teresa A. Sullivan says she's suspending all of the school's fraternities until January 9th. The move comes days after a Rolling Stone article in which a woman described being gang raped when she was a freshman in 2012. Okay, look, if she got gang raped, whoever did it, under the jail. That's a class. B1 felony in North Carolina. I don't know what it is in Virginia, but it's life in prison. Mm -hmm. There's no parole. There's no, well, you know, 20 to life. It's life. You go to prison. You stay there forever. And you deserve it. Gang rape is a class B1 felony. It's as bad as it gets short of premeditated murder. So if that happened, under the jail. Right. But only the people who did it. The magazine story revolves around the Phi Kappa Psi fraternity, which sits in a prestigious spot on campus, at the other end of an athletic field behind the university's president's office. Who gives a crap where it is? Yeah. In the article, a student named Jackie described how her initial excitement of being invited to a party at a fraternity was suddenly replaced by fear and violence as a group of men trapped her in a room and attacked her. Under the jail. If they did it, right. don't bother trying to take them into custody with, with minimum force. Beat them down <laughs> along the way. I hate this crap. The article says Jackie was pressured by peers to keep her story quiet and that administrators who knew about Jackie's story took no action, even after she reported allegations from two other girls who said they'd been assaulted in a similar way at the same fraternity. Again, under the jail. And you know these, right. you know these peers who told her to keep quiet? It's two female friends. She reported she came up. The story is, is that she came out bloody, bruised, torn clothing, told her two friends, and they said, don't tell anybody. Oh, if you tell somebody, we won't be able to go to any fraternity parties anymore. Okay, they can go into the jail <laughs> with them. Yeah. Did I also hear that she reported it to the university and they told her not to do anything? Or uh, I think that actually happened quite a bit later. Okay. In a letter to the school's students Saturday, Sullivan said she has asked the Charlottesville police to investigate the incident. I'm laughing because there's so many S's in this, it's hard to say. Her decision to place a temporary ban on fraternities follows a voluntary move by all UVA fraternities to suspend their social activities for this weekend. I'm sure that was voluntary. I'm sure that was voluntary, too. Voluntold. Even if it was voluntary, if they felt like suspending, great, fine, that's no problem. But if I was in a fraternity and I got told, oh, you're suspended for something that somebody else did in a different fraternity and is alleged to do, but there's no current proof of it, I'd have a party. And it'd be the F.U. party. 
And I swear to God, it'd be straight up F you Sullivan party. I'm going to do, you are not the boss of me. I, you don't punish me for something that somebody else did. So one group of people, some of whom have already graduated, are alleged to have committed a crime. It wasn't reported to the police. So the school response is ban all fraternities. And just who the heck these people think they are. I mean, did they do it? Then don't punish them. That's really yeah. simple. It's not that hard. Yeah, you got to wonder if maybe they, the University of Virginia faculty uh, or administration, just didn't like the idea of fraternities in the first place and said, oh, look, here's our opportunity. Never let a crisis go to waste. That because, does sound you know, a lot like what I think happened. Yeah. So the article says Jackie was pressured by peers to keep her story quiet and that administrators who knew about Jackie's story took no action. So um, is the administration taking any action against, oh, I don't know, their administrative department? Hey, let's let's send everybody who works in the UVA admin department home for a month. That's fair, right? Sounds good Because they me. knew about it. Anybody somebody, who knew about somebody it somebody did do something it. to protect this girl from whatever happened to her. They, sh- they don't need to go under the jail exactly, but they need to spend a little bit of time in the, uh, in the think about what you have done box. No, but we need to send everybody, well, even the people who didn't know, yeah, because somebody go. in the office knew. Yeah. I don't think that would work. I don't know why they would not do that. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. We need to get away from this idea that schools have any possible jurisdiction in criminal matters. I don't know where this came from. Uh, I don't know how it came up. But in the last year or so, it's been story after story after story about, you know, stuff like this where, you know, somebody says, oh, I was sexually assaulted. And then the university takes over. Uh, no, no, that's a that's a crime. Yeah, that's a crime. Get the police involved. Get the people who did it. Put them in a box someplace where they can't hurt anybody else. Yes. Solve the actual problem we have. We don't have a system where we have star chambers anymore. That was one of the reasons right. that we formed the country we have so that we had actual protections for people who were accused. But justice was impartial. It was not subject to the king's whims. And now what do we got? We got a university and the university is the king of the university is going to make the decisions. Somebody who's trained by going to a class somewhere. No, I want a judge. I want a jury. I want trained police investigators finding the evidence and presenting that evidence. I don't want people just making crap up and saying, well, you know, more likely than not, it's possible that you did this. And, you know, you're fired. Get out of the school. No. Well, that's our show for the week. Thanks again to Rob Allen for our music, and thank you for listening to the Gunblog Variety Cast. Constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSorrentino.com and hate mail to WizardPC at GunsCarsTech.com. Show notes can be found at the Gunblog Variety Cast forward slash episode 15. In a letter to the school students Saturday, Sullivan said she had asked the Charlottesville. In a letter to the school's students Saturday, Sullivan said, "Geez, how many S's are there in this?" <laughs> she said, "Seashells by the seashore." Thanks a lot, you jerks. In a letter to the school's students Saturday, Sullivan said she has asked the Charlottesville police to investigate the incident. I'm laughing because there's so many S's in this; it's hard to say. <laughs>